Thank you very much. Okay, so please join me in welcoming again Dr. Janet Smith. I have brought up 40 different titles uh, for the same, virtually for the same talk, um, but it's largely known as contraception, why not? Uh, years ago when I uh, was visiting one of my godchildren who was only eight at the time, he told me that when he he, w he misses me, he watches my video. So he, said, he said, I think it's called Contractions, why not? And then a, a couple years ago, I was in Trinidad and I was asked about a national problem in Trinidad. I was asked if I thought rapists should be castrated. And my knees kind of buckled and I said, oh my gosh, I said, I don't know the answer to that question. I said, obviously, rape's a terrible crime, it deserves a serial punishment, but that's permanent, it's mutilation. I said, I've heard there's drugs that can be used to control the sexual desire, maybe those should be pursued. And so the next day I'm leaving Trinidad and I'm buying a cigar for a friend and I look down and I see the national newspaper of Trinidad. It has the headline, Castrate Rapists. The subtitle there says, drugs can be used to reduce their sex drive, says US professor. <laughs> So I stood there and I said, oh my gosh, I hope there's some other U.S. professor in Trinidad this weekend. <laughs> I honestly couldn't read it. I had to put it, I just, I just pulled it up and I put it in my suitcase and it took me months even to, to look at it. I thought the Vatican is never going to ask me to do anything again. Right. So you can look for my three-part series of talks. Contraception, why not? Contractions, why not? Castration, why not? Right. <laughs> Time away. All right, uh, we've talked a lot about um, Humani Vitae and its history. Talk a little bit about the pill. Again, the pill was invented basically in 1960, and this was on the 40th year anniversary of the pill, and it says under there, so small, so powerful, and so misunderstood. Uh, I thought the bishop's talk was uh, terrific and, and many points and things I might want to incorporate sometimes in my talks about that one of the real pushes for the pill certainly was the population control problem, but it was very much what he was talking about as well, that we think technology can solve all of our problems. And we're, you know, we can put a man on the moon, what can be wrong with something so small and so powerful, the contraceptive pill, it's going to solve so many problems, and how can it possibly be wrong to, to use man's intelligence to be able to control something that's caused us a lot of problems in many ways. Children, a lot of children, children that come at inconvenient times, and all sorts of hardship. Why shouldn't we be able to use our intelligence to, intelligence to manage our bodies in such a way? And the expectations of the contraceptive pill were huge, and some people still think it's like one of the major excellent inventions in the history of mankind. You have the car, you have the airplane, you have the pill, you have the internet, but the pill is way up there, maybe in top 10 inventions in the history of mankind. It, so it's gonna ensure sexual freedom. Again, that people now are kind of inhibited because there, there might be a pregnancy at the end of a sexual act, so that's inhibiting, right? It was gonna advance happiness. People would be so much more happy if they could control their fertility, if they could have sex lives that weren't threatened um, by a pregnancy there were going to be fewer unwed pregnancies. Obviously, if you could control when you got pregnant, there would be fewer unwed pregnancies. And if there were fewer unwed pregnancies, surely there would be fewer abortions. Okay. There would be better marriages. People could test out many partners before marriage. They could cohabit and test out a, a relationship before they got married. And within marriage, you, <coughs> excuse me, you could have sex without the fear of a pregnancy. And of course, you could control overpopulation. Now, those aren't ridiculous expectations, it seems to me. It seems to me there's a, a logic to this. And I'm not certain that people in the 1960s could be blamed uh, for thinking that these things were going to happen. But we've had a 50-year now um, workshop, experiment, on the contraceptive pill and other kinds of forms of contraception made widely available. And I think we can honestly say, if you, if you go just a little bit below the surface, 
you're going to find out that none of these things have happened and a lot of bad things have come about through contraception. So we expected one thing and we got another. Right? And the church has an explanation for why that's the case. The church has an explanation about why it is we might have expected one thing, but actually something else happened. All right? Because it understands, it really does understand human nature. It understands who we are. It does understand sexuality. It does understand God's plan for sexuality. And then if we mess with God's plan for sexuality, it's definitely not going to be good for us. So on a human plane, you can say, gee, all these things should have happened. But you, again, you, you go a little bit deep, just, again, a, just a little bit below for the surface and look at all the sociological data, you're going to find out we're going to just do skim this. I mean, if you were to just do some work on the internet, you'd find amazing things as far as where we are um, in, in respect to all of these. But the church has an understanding of God's plan for sexuality, has an, understand of hum, an understanding of human nature. Uh, what has happened? Well, I'm going to make a claim, at least, that I think a decent one, that if not an um, unassailable one, that contraception has been bad for male-female relationships, it's been bad for the health of women, that it actually facilitates sex outside of marriage, and that's not a good thing. It increases the incidence of sexually transmitted diseases. It leads to unwanted pregnancy and single parenthood. It causes and leads to abortion. It contributes to divorce. It contributes to poverty and social chaos. It's harmful to the environment. And it paves the way for same-sex unions. That's a long list. I can't actually cover all those in the time I've got here before me. But you can find articles on the internet, half of them written by me, um, that, that, um, <laughs> that uh, substantiate these with various studies. Now, Pope Paul VI made four predictions in Humanae Vitae about what happened if the contraceptive pill became widely available. He said there would be a general lowering of morality. Anybody noticed that in the last 50 years? <laughs> I told you what it was like growing up in the 50s a little bit. That's a stark contrast, a stark contrast, right? Less respect for women. Anybody noticed that in the last 50 years? I mean, the Me Too movement has been pretty incredible, hasn't it been? I mean, you actually see some major commentators saying, you know, maybe the pills behind some of this. Maybe the fact that men have begun to look upon all women as sexually available at all times is somehow behind this just incredible amount of sexual harassment that seems to be everywhere. And believe me, men are not naturally sexual harassers, right? This is, this is a product that we've had, men being more fallen creatures, so of course there's an element of men that is given to sexual misbehavior. I mean, that's certainly true, but it's not something that's not controllable. Right? In the history of man, it's, mankind, it's been controllable. Different times, very controllable. It's a, <laughs> men are by, by nature designed to be protectors, protectors of women and children. That's who they're designed to be. And we can either foster that in males, or we can foster in males a kind of predator, being a predator. You can go either way. I mean, women can be nurturing, beautiful females, or we can just be selfish, um, egotistical whiners, if you want, demanders. Right? We can be one or the other. We can either cultivate people to bring out the best of themselves, or we can cultivate people to bring out the worst. And our culture is now bringing out the worst, I think, often in both men and women, by the way we're shaping them and, and forming them. Okay, we said that, he said there would be coercive control by governments over sexuality. Just think of the HHS mandate, trying to force the, 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 everybody to pay for any woman's uh, contraceptive. Think of one child per family policy in China. Think of what is it now, they're saying something like 60 million unmarried males for every available female in China, 60 million? because people who can only have one child in China prefer a male child. They want someone to carry on the, the family. Since they're allowed only one child, they abort their female babies. And then you have 60 million men who don't have a bride and who are not going to have a bride unless what? Unless they steal a bride, right? Unless they steal little girls. Right? That's the future of China. So it's going, what are you gonna do with 70 million men for who are 60? I don't, it was going to be 70, I think it's 60. Anyway, a lot, many million of men who don't have brides. 
What is it in the future for those men? Okay, and we treat our bodies like machines. You know, the transgender movement is something that nobody saw coming, nobody. Right? John Paul, I mean, Paul VI says here, we're gonna treat our bodies like machines, and that certainly came into existence with like IVF, all right? If you can't conceive a child naturally, you can make a child through IVF. So we started just treating our bodies in a certain sense like machines. But this transgender movement is something that, five years ago, if you'd asked anybody, are, are we, is Target going to have bathrooms for transgendered kids? And are we gonna to have to have big fights over what pronouns we can use for people? Everybody, nobody would have said, nobody would have said that. 20 years ago, nobody would have said we're gonna have same-sex marriages. But there's something now where our bodies aren't us in any way. Our bodies are just something we occupy. And if we don't like the way our bodies are, we can change it. If, we don't like, if I don't like the sex I am, I could change it. You know, this was preceded by an interesting little movement that's still out there of people who, who don't like, uh, they want to be an amputee. They want to have um, one leg lost or an arm. They don't want two arms and they don't want two legs. You say, I'm like, oh, it's too weird. You say, well, yeah, it's weird. Um, people are weird. <laughs> we have all sorts of weird things going on in us. But if, you know, they, people have been doing that. They've been forcefully, like, lying down on a, on a, a train track or using a, a, a saw to take off a limb. Now, if, I think if you were a, a physician, someone came to you and said, you know, I, I really don't want my right arm. I look in the mirror and it seems to me strange that I have two arms. That's what these people say. They say, I don't see myself as a two-armed person. So I want to have this arm removed. Now, these people apparently pass some sort of sanity test, right? For me, I, I already know. I don't, need, I don't need to do any tests. This person's troubled. It's a troubled person. I say, what, what's the problem? What's the problem? Why don't, why don't you want both arms? Everybody has two arms. So if someone comes in and says, I, I feel like I'm the wrong sex, she said, yeah, I'm so sorry. What do we do now? You know, but one thing we don't do is cut off the arm, or the person says, I don't want an arm. One thing we don't do is we don't turn you into the opposite sex. We do, it, we do something else. Um, so we trade our bodies like machines. I can trade my machine in. You know, I can trade it, my female machine, I can trade in for somehow get a male machine. And then if I got tired of that, I could change back again, maybe, all right? So this is where we are. How does this all trace back to the pill? How does this all trace back to the pill? It's going to say we don't like the way our bodies are, right? There's something wrong with being a fertile female. I need to take a pill to change that. There's something wrong with being a fertile male. You need to get a vasectomy. There's something wrong with that as opposed to say, isn't fertility a sign of health in an adult human being? And isn't it those who are infertile who are not healthy? And aren't they the ones that need some medical treatment or something to help them bring, back, bring them back to the healthy state of being fertile? But we now think, as the bishop says, we've got complete control over everything. Nothing is given anymore. We think we can use technology to change anything. I love technology. I love cars, I love airplanes, I love computers, etc. But you know, you don't want to, you know, we could all make, you could all be blissfully happy in here. We all take opioids or something, right? If you get, anybody got a little sadness or misery in your life, we can, we can fix that. We can give you drugs to fix that. But would anybody really be satisfied with that? That's not genuine happiness. You can't take a pill to really get genuine happiness. You're saying, well, using a pill to change your sexual life. And I say, again, I'll well, talk a bit more about this later, but once you mess around with your sexual life, you're messing around with your humanity, with your relationship to the other person, even your relationship to God. Everything changes. It's not just a so small, so powerful, so mis certainly so misunderstood. So let's just get a little review on how contraception works. Too few people know this. All right, this is, there's four rows here. And this shows the fluctuation of hormones in a woman's body, healthy woman's body, in the course of a month. A lot of people don't know that women are basically born with all the eggs we're ever going to have. Possibly a couple hundred thousand, maybe even more than a million. But that's, we, don't, we don't produce more eggs in our lifetime. Of course, males. <laughs> I always say any male could populate China in a day, um, <laughs> given enough time and opportunity. I mean, it's just incredible the amount of... The amount of how fertile males are. Real, I mean, females are relatively infertile. We have a shorter um, number of years of fertility. 
And every month, we ripen and release only one egg. Occasionally more, but very rarely, right? We ripen and release one egg. That egg lives in our body for only 24 hours. And that egg can be fertilized for only 12 of those 24 hours. So there's only a 12-hour window every month when a woman can get pregnant. That's more complicated than that I'll talk about, but that's a fact. So women usually ovulate somewhere around day 13 or 14. Again, the egg lives for 24 hours. If she gets pregnant, then she's pregnant for the next nine months. If she doesn't, that egg dies and it disintegrates basically. Right? So these two charts are showing that the second uh, row is showing the egg as it ripens and then it becomes fully uh, mature. This woman doesn't get pregnant, so it, it changes. And as it changes, it triggers again a change in hormones. So those two hormones in the top row are helping a woman ripen and release an egg. And so there's a peak of those hormones at about the same day that she ovulates. And then it goes down because it's caused her to ovulate. And now she can't ovulate again for the rest of the month, and that reduces. Then in the third row, you see another set of hormones, which are the hormones that help a woman produce what's on the fourth row, which is a very rich endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus that's going to be the new little home for the, the, home for the new little human being that might, that if she gets pregnant, will come down the fallopian tube and embed in the wall of the uterus. And that's, she's building that up, and if she doesn't get pregnant, as happens here, she sloughs that off, and that's where a woman has her menstrual period every month, where she bleeds because that nice endometrium that's bit, built up every month is not being used for pregnancy. So a woman's body is working every month, if you will. It's preparing every month for pregnancy. That's what it's doing. That's how our bodies are made. Right? Now you'll notice this interesting thing. You notice these hills and valleys in a woman's chemical makeup every month. I want to tell you, um, that means, I mean, women are chemically, basically, a different woman every day of the month. Right. Now, ladies, I think you know this. You know, you know when you get up in the morning, you don't know who you are. Right? You don't know whether you're the sweetest human being on the first face of the earth or a real shrew, right? And you usually don't know this until you talk to some male. And for somehow, that reveals it to us, right? We can't help that. I mean, that's physiologically the case. We are physiologically different person every day of the month. Now, you know how much fluctuation there is in male hormones in a month? Wanna know? This is what it looks like. <laughs> straight, straight as can be, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? So is there a complementarity here that God has put on the face of the earth? Right? It's incredible. So. What happens with this, what you have to know here, is that the chemical contraceptives completely suppress these natural contraceptives. What the chemical contraceptives do is they put in a woman's body synthetic forms of the hormones that a woman has in her body when she's pregnant. Because when a woman is pregnant, she, can't, she doesn't ovulate. Because there's no point in ovulating if you're already pregnant. So what, what happens here is this, this chart gets completely flattened out with um, chemical hormones, not the natural hormones of pregnancy, but with chemical hormones. So a woman who is using a chemical contraceptive is in a state of pseudo-pregnancy. It's not a natural state at all. Women are either supposed to be going through fertile cycles, or they're supposed to be pregnant, or past childbearing age, or before childbearing age. Everything a woman is, is geared towards childbearing or not childbearing as far as our bodies are concerned. So, a woman who is using a pseudo-contraceptive, I mean, is in a state of pseudo-pregnancy when she uses a chemical contraceptive, that's a very unnatural state. Again, why do we take pills? Why do we use medication? Usually because we're sick. And there's nothing sick about being fertile. Right? We don't want to put chemicals in our food. I go to the grocery stores, there's organic tomatoes, organic bananas, organic everything. And I look at all the women around me thinking they're all taking contraceptives. They're putting these chemicals in their body day after day, month after month, year after year, to avoid something that happens only 12 hours every month. Does it make sense? It doesn't seem to me to make sense. But just quickly to explain natural family planning, 
This is a chart that's used largely in third world countries because they understand things more simply than we do. They're smarter, okay? We get confused, right? This chart, chart shows three phases in a woman's uh, cycle. We have the sunshine, we have rain, and we have the sunshine again. And what this means, there's at least three things, at least three things that you need to get pregnant. One is an egg, one is a sperm, and something else called fertile mucus. There's a certain mucus that a woman secretes that helps carry the sperm to meet the egg. Right? And if without that mucus, there's no way that a woman can get pregnant because that's designed to help carry the sperm to meet the egg. Now, all those hormones that we just looked at also are involved in the uh, production and also the stopping of the production of the fertile mucus. So at the beginning of the month, we see this, this sun, which is supposed to indicate a dry period where a woman can't detect any of this fertile mucus in her system. So there's no egg there. She doesn't ovulate until we get those little people. There's no egg in her system until you get those little people. So she can't get pregnant because there's no egg there. And there's no fertile mucus there. So if she had sexual intercourse every day, 10 times a day, during that period of the month, she could not get pregnant, right? There's no egg, there's no fertile mucus, there's no sperm. Somewhere around day, we're not counting days, because a woman will, will recognize the appearance of the fertile mucus in her system. Somewhere around day oh, 9, 10, 11, a woman sh this fertile mucus appears. Right? That's usually about five days before she ovulates. The fertile mucus appears about five days before she ovulates. Now that fertile mucus can actually keep the sperm alive for up to five days. So if a woman has sexual intercourse on Monday, but not Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but ovulates on Friday, she might get pregnant from the act of sexual intercourse she had on Monday because the fertile mucus kept the sperm alive until she ovulated. That happens very rarely, about 3% of the time. If a woman has sexual intercourse on the day that she ovulates, she only has about a 43% chance of getting pregnant. So women are not highly fertile creatures. Right? It's only a short window of the month. Right? But again, for those five days before she ovulates, any sperm that's deposited in her body could get carried to meet the egg when the egg appears. But if she doesn't get pregnant, then the egg dies. The fertile mucus, as it suggests here, dries up about two or three days after she ovulates. So for the rest of the month, you see that dryness. And that dryness means there's no fertile mucus there. She's already ovulated. There's not going to be a second ovulation in the month. So again, it doesn't matter how many times she has sexual intercourse in that third phase. She cannot get pregnant. The only period of the time that she can get pregnant during the month is about the seven to 10 days in the middle of the month where the fertile mucus is there that can possibly impregnate the egg that shows up for only 24 hours and it can be impregnated for only 12 of those 24 hours. So this is what natural family planning is all about, is a woman learning how to read her signs. There's several signs. There's fertile mucus. When a woman ovulates, her temperature goes up a little bit and stays up for the rest of the month. There's a change in her cervix, and there's, an ovula there's various ovulation monitors now that are very accurate um, that women can use to determine where they are uh, in their cycle. This makes perfect sense. I mean, when you talk about using our intelligence to control our fertility, this is intelligent, right? It's working with a woman's natural cycles, altogether healthy, no terrible hormones that she's putting into her body. And if a woman has any problems with fertility, this is the way you discover them. You discover her cycle is too short, or her cycle is too long, or it, it starts and it stops. You say, oh, there's some underlying problem that needs to be treated here, right? So it's a fan and also, ladies, I recommend all my my friends who have parents or parents of teenagers, teach your teenage girls this. You know that day when the girl has her first period and then she becomes a monster, all right? She cries a lot and there's a lot of drama and there's a lot of slamming of doors and there's a lot of, just a lot of, a lot of drama as they say, right? She can't help it. I mean, she's got a whole new chemical makeup that she hasn't had before. How is she supposed to know how to deal with that? Right, so you help her chart this and you help her know when it's coming and then you help her deal with it. You say, just go take a nap. Don't interact with any other human being, all right? Go listen to music, all right? We're not gonna demand anything of you today. Just go rest somewhere. Do something that makes you feel calm and happy. Chocolate, all right? So, now, 
The big problem here, this is an older chart, but it's still pretty accurate. This is how the, the contraceptives, the kind of contraceptives that are used by women in different age groups. 27% uh, of women uh, between the ages of 15 and 24 have been sterilized. 9% depend upon male sterilization. 31% on oral contraception, 9% on injectables, implantations, 18% on condoms, and 8% on all others. So that's 40% of women between 55 and 44 are using a chemical contraceptive. And you can have used them. You can be sure that most of those are down to the lower end. The younger women are the ones who are using the chemical contraceptives and the injectables. The older ones are using the sterilization and sometimes even the condoms because it's just a stopgap measure. If they really got pregnant, it wouldn't matter that much. But what it means is that women in their courtship period, between 15 and 30 or so, are using the chemical contraceptives. Right? And that really changes a woman's physiology and her response to the world. Not only how she feels herself, but we're going to see that God has designed the body in a certain way that these hormones help a woman actually in their relationship with males. They radically change the relationships whether a woman is contracepting or not contracepting. So we have this myth that contraception will help male-female relationships. Now, this book is one of my favorite books, uh, The Decline of Males, written in 1999, a very interesting book. Now, my mother told me I should never make fun of people's names. And, but Lionel Tiger, you see, he, he works with someone named Robin Fox, and they are anthropologists who study animal behavior to explain human behavior. It's a little irresistible, right? Lionel Tiger. Now, Lionel Tiger was a very smart man, is a very smart man, and he saw that contraception was going to radically change male-female relationships. So he, they did a study in the 70s of a, a tribe of monkeys that were on an island. And there was one male monkey who was named Austin, and he was the alpha monkey of the tribe. And he had three female monkeys who were his exclusive sexual partners. And they gave shots of Depo-Provera to, all, to um, those three female monkeys. And Austin lost all interest in them and chose three other female monkeys to be his sexual partners. Then they gave shots of Depo-Provera to all the female monkeys, and all the males stopped having sexual intercourse and it started acting in a confused and turbulent fashion. Poor males, right? Now, what does that suggest? Well, we have all sorts of evidence that males are way more attracted to women who are having fertile cycles. Men are most attracted to women when they're having their fertile cycle. And if women are using contraceptives, they're not having a fertile cycle, right? They are not having those hormones that attract men to them. Fascinating, huh? I gave this talk once in Kansas. This man came up to me and said, called me girl. He said, girl, he said, uh, you don't need to tell us about these studies in Kansas. He said, you know, we got cows and bulls in Canada, Kansas. He says, you know, you put a bull in a pen a mile away from a cow, and in a fertile per period, he'll get there. He said, <laughs> we've seen that. Or I say, some, sometimes the results are unfortunate, OK? Right, this is a, there's another fascinating study about um, male and female attraction done with human uh, subjects. They took a, did a slideshow with a bunch of males in the room and a slideshow of supermodels. And they had the men rate how attractive they found the supermodels to be. They found them to be very, very attractive. Then they put something in the room that was soaked with female fertile hormones and it, you can't smell it, but you receive it through your olfactory nerves. And then they showed them slides of ordinary women and asked them to rate the attractiveness of the ordinary women. And they found them more attractive than the supermodels. Now, ladies, think about it. <laughs> right? All that money that you're paying to have your hair done and your nails and your makeup and clothing, and it's the fertile hormones that make the difference, <laughs> right? You don't have to be a supermodel. You just have to have a woman has fertile si a fertile cycle. And what are women doing? They're suppressing that fertile cycle precisely at the time when they're trying to attract a mate, right? This is a, one of the studies. They say female chemical messengers, known as pheromones, may help dupe men 
into thinking plain women are more attractive and beautiful women are less attractive than they actually are. Pheromones, the colorless, odorless chemical signals given off by the body, are thought to affect behavior of both animals and humans at a subconscious level. Ladies, think about it, right? Think about it. I taught at the University of Dallas. My office was on the third floor. I could watch down the, on the square when students were mixing between classes. I would know some of the young women who were not sexually active, who were not using contraceptives. And they were male magnets, right? They, they were having fertile cycles and the men just flocked to them, right? Then I'd see a girl who I knew not to be so, so pure and modest. And she was usually dressed very immodestly, makeup all over the place and hair done. And, she walks down the mall and the, the good guys look and look away, right? So trouble there. The bad guys get a good big look, right? So you want a good guy, right? I'll well, talk more about that. But men are very attracted to women who are having fertile cycles. And women are just discounting that and suppressing their fertile cycles. The face of fertility. Why do men find women who are near ovulation more attractive? Women are most fertile a week after their period begins. At this time, they experience changes in their psychology, behavior, and physiology that are akin to changes we see in non-human primates. A new study suggests that women's faces also get redder. Blah, 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 it goes on. I, you know, in the day of the selfie, try it. Take a picture of yourself every day of the month, and then just see which period, of, which time of the month you even think you're most attractive. And it's likely going to be during your fertile cycle. So men find us most attractive during that time. Now, as far as women are concerned and their response to men, this is a famous study, the T-shirt test, where they had a group of two males, human males and human females. One group of females was contraceptive, the other was not. The males were, were rated somehow as evolutionarily desirable, right? Some that were apparently competent and aggressive and this, that, and the other thing, and then sort of like losers, right? So they have these men wear a t-shirt. Women are very attracted to men on the basis of smell. And sometimes the real smell, and sometimes just, again, the pheromones. But they had the women smell the t-shirts after a day, and the women who were not contracepting chose the men who were evolutionarily desirable, and the women who were contracepting chose the losers as the one that they thought they would like to meet and date. Now, I've had mothers come up to me afterwards and say, that explains a lot. <laughs> and I says, what does it explain? And they say, well, it explains why my, my girl's with that loser. She's using contraception. What does she see in him? Nobody knows, right? Other women will say, that explains how my wonderful son can't seem to get the girls. They're all contracepting, and they can't perceive how great he is. There's many other things that go on. People choose people when they're not contracepting. Women choose men with whom they have a better chance at conceiving a child, all right? There's something biological there that your body is more attracted to someone with whom you have the possibility of conceiving. Now, it, that's a scary thing because in our culture, most people choose their spouses while they're contracepting. Right? And there's, there was a, a show on NBC10.com some time ago, uh, that was that they where it says that many doctors call the pill the divorce pill, the divorce pill, because women after they get married they decide that they want to have a baby, so they go off the pill. They find out they're not all that attracted to the man they married, because they married they chose that man when they were on the contraceptive pill, and so that's not the person with whom they have the strongest chemical. You know that we we talk about that phrase, the chemistry is good between the two of them. And the chem, you know, you, you sit in a room and, you know, 20, 25, say, members of the opposite sex, basically the same age as you, you're not going to be equally attracted to all of them. And for all sorts of reasons. And some of them is just like boing, you know, it's boing. And you walk across the room and you find out they're a Democrat or something and it just <laughs> disappears. All right. So this is, this is that study. All right, say, on Health Watch, an Ivy League scientist, an Ivy League scientist, along with other researchers, believe a, um, a lot of women are taking a pill that is wrecking their relationships. Women actually rate how a man smells as the most important factor when trying to choose a romantic partner. I don't believe that. But anyway, that's what it says. According to a scientist in Switzerland, Klaus Weidekin, women who take the birth control pill mess up their sense of smell. 
he says the pill makes women feel pregnant. So they feel they need, they, like they need to be protected. And they tend to go for a guy who smells like their father or brother. Contraception may also kill your libido. This is a beautiful thing. You're taking contraception so you can have sex, but you're not interested in having sex. Right? When women on the pill were tested, levels of a chemical which wipes out testosterone were found to be seven times higher than in those who had never taken it. Women also produce testosterone, and testosterone is also the um, reason for a woman's sexual drive. It says past studies have suggested that taking the pill could dampen a woman's sexual desire, but that if she came off it, her libido would return within a month. Dr. Goldstein, former director of the Institute for Sexual Medicine at Boston University, Massachusetts, said that while his research seemed to suggest the effects could be permanent, more investigations were needed. Shocking. You take the pill, it reduces your desire for sex. You go off the pill, your desire may not return. Right? So you wonder, women wonder why they don't have a strong sexual drive. That's because they've been contracepting, that's why. Who wants to do that? Right? I love this cartoon. Yes, I admit it, I do look at other men, but if it makes you feel any better, I don't find them attractive either. Right? <laughs> She's using the pill. She just doesn't find, she doesn't have fertile cycles. And the fertile cycles, women will tell you that their sexual desire is the strongest when they're in their fertile phase. That's frustrating, of course, when using natural family planning. You want to have sex at the time, you, you, if you're wanting to control your family size, and limit your family size for some reason, you have the strongest desire to have. A lot of women complain about that, rightly so. But you want to say at least once a month they do have a sexual desire. Those are con contracepting don't, right? So at least you have it sometimes, right? And I always say, you know, men seem to have it like a lot of the time, maybe all the time. And so if men are having to control themselves all the time, why is it so wrong to expect women to have to control themselves some of the time, right? Maybe they'll have more sympathy. Uh, for males, and people have a greater understanding of what an incredible achievement chastity is um, for men. I, I mean, the men I've talked to say, you just can't imagine sometimes how torture it is. They say, driving 50 miles down some highways, he, he, they've counted something like 30 opportunities for lust in the advertisements. Say, so you're just driving down, and all you really want to do is think about cows and horses and tomorrow, and boom, 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 boom. You know? Who needs it? Right? So, another myth. It will make for happier marriages. And the fact is that 40% of the 80% of those marrying today will divorce within 20 years. Right? That's predictable. Now the divorce rates track the use of contraception quite enormously. Right? In, in 1950, only about 10 out of 1,000 women got divorced. The lowest there was 9.2 in 1980. By 1975, 1980, between 1960, 60, or let's say 1960 and 1980, the divorce rate way more than doubled, right? That more than doubled. The divorce rate more than doubled between 1960 and 1980. What happened between 1960 and 1980 that would cause an unprecedented, um, no, nowhere in the history of mankind has a divorce rate doubled in a 20 year period? Doubled in a 20-year period, right? How did that happen? Well, I'm sure there's lots of contributing factors, but who can deny that the pill is a factor? It came on the market in 1960. By about 1970, any woman who wanted it had it, right? And then the divorce rate just skyrocketed. Now it's gone down, but the biggest reason the divorce rate has gone down is because people are not getting married. They're cohabiting. I often say a lot of people have had a divorce or two before they got married. Right? They entered into cohabitation thinking it was going to lead to marriage, and it didn't. They broke up after two or three years. That's your first divorce. You do it a second time, that's your second divorce. And then you get married. So I, I mean, I'm glad people aren't getting divorced, but I'm not exactly certain that it's showing that we're being smarter about our choice of spouses, that we're better at marriage, right? or we have a better commitment uh, to marriage. And the effect on divorce, of course, on children, of course, is tremendous, right? Um, there's a book out now called Primal Loss that is about adult children, uh, their testimonies, uh, who's adult, adult, adults who were children when their parents got divorced, and how it's affected them for the last 15, 20, 30 years. 
And this whole myth that we have that the kids can handle it, the kids are resilient, this book really shows it's not true. Uh, and I've actually heard of people who've read the book and decided not to get divorced. Right? There are many studies on this. They've, they've had a study that shows that you get two sets of couples that are both in a miserable state in their marriage, and both groups are intending to divorce. And one group goes for counseling and commits to trying to work at the relationship. The other group gets divorced. Ten years later, the group that got divorced are really say they're no happier, right? They're no happier than they were than they were married. The ten who stayed in the marriage can hardly remember that they wanted to get divorced at one time. Okay? So working in a marriage is a very wise thing. But I think contraception leads to bad choices for many reasons. I've already talked about that. But I think there's there's more, I mean, if people cohabit, I think people now slide into marriage, right? You start dating someone. In our culture, that means you're going to start having sex pretty soon. After you start having sex for a while, you're saying, well, why am I driving home every night? We might as well share an apartment. So then you move in with each other. Right? And then you're together for about a year and a half. And you haven't made a decision that this is a possible future spouse. This is just someone you've been dating, you started having sex with. You know, that, it's fun, it's fun, it's fun. He's cool. And then you're on what, what Dr. Laura used to call your auditioning for marriage, in a sense. You're on your best behavior. Because you know if you break up, you'd have to start all over again. You'd have to split up the TV. And who gets the TV? Who gets the couch? Who gets the dog? Oh my gosh, it's harder than a custody arrangement, right? Who gets the dog? And then you have to start all over again. So people cohabit for two or three years, and people say, when are you going to get married? You look at each other and say, well, why not now? Um, you know, sex is pretty good. We don't fight that much. Sex, so why not get married? And then you get married. Two or three years later, you start talking about important things. Like, should we have children? And one goes, says, oh, well, I thought we'd have a few more time, years of just happy cop coupleship. And the other says, no, I, I, I really want to have a child or two or three or four, because I, you know, I had three brothers and sisters, and I thought it was great, and I want my, my kids to have the same thing. And the other says, well, what are you talking about? One at a time, or I don't know, I never wanted to have more than one. Or some of the other might say, I want to start going back to church. Church? Where'd that come from? We never talked about church. You don't expect me to go, do you? You know, and all of a sudden you're talking about things I think you should talk about in about the first three weeks of dating, right? What are your non-negotiables? Get them out there. Don't fall in love before you've had a conversation about some of these very important things. Because being in love makes you stupid, right? <laughs> and it makes you ignore things that you should really pay attention to. Sex makes you even more stupid than love, right? So if you start having sex with someone, you're not going to want to, and you're enjoying it, you're not going to want to break up. You're not going to ask the questions that might cause you to break up. Now, this is some information I'd like every teenager to have, every teenage girl. Some of these studies are done in terms that are difficult to accept, but this is a, done by the CDC, and it's looking at, uh, it claims that it shows that the delay in sexual activity leads to greater marital stability. So here you have, if girls have sex at 12 and younger, they only have about an 18% chance of having a stable marriage. Right? If you go up, up to the top there, when I mean, they're 26 or older before they have their first sexual encounter, I might, my guess is that most of those who wait to 26 wait until marriage, but maybe I'm wrong. But if you're 26 before you have your first act of sexual intercourse, you have almost a 70% chance of having a stable marriage. Right? That's amazing. Uh, who, I, one thing I can count on with young people when I talk to them is they don't want to get divorced. They hate divorce. Young people hate divorce, either because it's happened in their family or because it's happened to their friends. And they see the turmoil that it causes in their lives. Every other weekend having to go somewhere, missing this, missing that, scheduling, 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 who's going to pick up who, who's going to, who didn't show up on time, blah, blah, blah. I've seen it in my own family. It's a nightmare. And I'm the aunt, and boy do I resent it that I don't get to see my nieces and nephews at the holidays, right? And why don't I get to see them? Because they're off with their father, because I get to see him on the holidays. It disrupts so many things, right? right? Women who have more non-marital sexual partners are less likely to have stable marriages. If a girl has zero sexual partners before she gets married, if she's a virgin when she gets married, she's going to have an 80% chance of having marital stability. 80% chance. Sounds good to me, right? If she's had 21 or more partners, 
somewhere around 20%. It keeps going. We just look at one. You have one sexual partner before marriage, it drops to about 50% chance of having marital stability. Amazing numbers, huh? So, divorce rate for those using NFP? 2%. Couples who use NFP almost never divorce. Now, is it just abstaining a couple days a month that makes a difference? No. No. It's everything that, that comes with it. All right, a respect for each other, a respect for fertility, a respect for God, right? Talking about things, that's a huge thing, is talking about things. Couples who use natural family planning have almost um, a coerced and forced reason to have a an important conversation every month, which is that couples do want to have sex. And they do want to have sex, physiologically speaking, more when she's fertile than when she's not. So that fertile period comes and now there's a, a mutual desire to have sex. But you look at the calendar and you say, hmm, I think I've entered the fertile phase. And then the conversation goes something like this. Why did we decide it wasn't a good idea to have another child right now? Huh? And the answers can, are, are not so different from what I've heard. I've been accused of standing in people's, hiding in people's bedrooms. But they often go like this. She says, well, the reason we decided not to have any children is I have three, five, and under, and I'm exhausted, and you said you'd help, and you never do. And he says, would you like to go shopping on Saturday by yourself? All right? I'll give him the baths tonight. All right? Does that help? She might say, say to him, and she might say to her, the reason we decided not to have any more children is because the way you spend money. I, or how am I ever going to put all these kids through school? I, I don't know, he said, and she, she says, your friend Jane gets a new kitchen, you need a new kitchen. Your friend Jane gets a fence, you need a fence. She might say, I don't need that kitchen. I don't need that fence, I had no idea. You have these conversations a couple times, and you really start to find out where you both are. But this is the big thing it's done. It's really changed our understanding of sex. This young man meets this young woman, nice to meet you, would you like to go to have dinner, go to, have, go to a movie, and then have sex? And she says, sure, why not? Now, of course, that's unduly formal. It never happens that way. It basically happens, you want to come back to my room and have a drink. And then another drink, another and another drink. And then you lose your inhibitions and you have sex. And you may not know each other's last names. Right? You get up in the morning and you don't know each other and it's embarrassing. And, you know, you have to walk away. And that's what our culture is. That's what our culture is these days. You've been reading some of those stories, maybe on... Um, the one that did, oh, I don't know, we have to talk about this, but anyway. So, the result of that way of thinking is that people now think that getting pregnant is an accident. And people talk about accidental pregnancies. Right? I would say, that's not possible. Right? It's not possible to get pregnant by accident. It's not. You can fall on a banana peel by accident, you can drive your car over a cliff by accident, but you can't get pregnant by accident. Right? We know the cause and we know the effect. You know, if you put your foot on a gas pedal of the car and it goes forward, you don't say, oh, how did that happen? <laughs> right? We know the cause and we know the effect. It actually means something's gone right with the act of sexual intercourse if you get pregnant. The act has done what it's meant to do. But people now think that having sex and having babies are two entirely different things. Right? People one time thought that if you have sex, you shouldn't have sex unless you're in love. Right? You shouldn't have sex unless you're prepared for babies. And you're not prepared for babies until you're married. And that was pretty much a formula that people believed in. And people got things in the wrong order all through the history of mankind, but they believed that. They believed that you shouldn't have sex unless you're in love, you shouldn't have sex unless you're prepared for babies, and you're not prepared for babies until you're married. And now you don't have to know the person's last name to have sex. You don't have to have any, never any conversation. I had a friend in college who was having sex with and what we thought to be the handsomest man on campus. I have to admit I was a little jealous, but I was always this hard-headed realist, and I asked her, I said, I said, what happens if you get pregnant? And she said, I don't know him well enough to ask. Right? Now, why is it that sex is something you can do with someone you barely know, and asking a person what happens if I get pregnant is too intimate a question? Well, it's threatening, of course. Because if you said, what happens if I get pregnant, where does the conversation go? In this day and age, it goes like, huh, um, uh, like who's talking pregnancy here? I mean, it, well, I mean, mm, 
Did you want to have that relationship talk? Is that what this is about? Well, I didn't say an L word, did I? I never said love, did I? But did I? Well, I mean, I thought you were using precautions. I mean, I, I'll take, I mean, I've got a condom, but that's the thing. I thought you were using the pill. That's the conversation, right? Oh, listen, I'm a decent guy. I'll pay for half the abortion. Now, it used to be in the 1960s, people would, men would regularly say, if a woman said, and she would say, what happens if I get pregnant? She would ask. And he would say, well, I'll marry you. That's why I want to have sex with you. I love you. He said, we'll just move it up by a couple months. You get pregnant, we'll get married. I want to marry you anyway. That's what it's all about. Now, the smart woman said, well, yes, I'll have sex with you. On our wedding night. On our wedding night. Remember that, girls? Yes, I'll have sex with you. On our wedding night. Right? That's the right time. Now, a lot of people got pregnant before marriage in the 60s. There's a lot of kids whose first baby is born six months, five months after the wedding date, right? But they still knew that sex led to babies that meant marriage, right? Which we don't know anymore. I mean, God did mean that the first day that a woman gets her positive pregnancy test is meant to be one of the very happiest days of her life, where she calls up her spouse and she says, darling, we're having a baby. And they go berserk, right? They make a dozen, two dozen, three dozen phone calls. They go to Target and start buying stuff, more stuff and more stuff. They get a book of babies' names. Now, in the United States, 42% of babies are born out of wedlock. My guess is for those 42% of women, that positive pregnancy is not the happiest day in their life. Because what are the choices? You're an unwed woman, you get a positive pregnancy test. They're in the movies all the time now. Because women relate to that. Oh, yeah, I've been there. My sister's been there. My best friend's been there. Everybody's been there. A positive pregnancy test, or not positive, but a pregnancy test, where am I now? If it's a positive pregnancy test, what goes through your head? What do I do now? Do I marry him? I barely know him. He's a jerk. Why don't I marry him? Or no, I'm crazy about him. I definitely want to marry him, but I don't want to feel like I forced him into marriage. I don't want to feel like I coerced him into marriage. What do I do now? Do I have an abortion? I hope not, right? What do I do now? Do I put a baby up for, a baby up for adoption? Very few women do. Those who do are heroic and generous and marvelous, but very few do. Do I become a single mother? Many, many women do. And virtually every one of them would tell you they'd rather have a husband helping them with that baby. I'm going to take at least five, but maybe two or three more. All right, the good news is, is that teen pregnancies are down. The bad news is that pregnancies of oh, other women are up on wet pregnancies. Teenagers are getting smarter or something else, um, doing other sexual acts or using um, abort, uh, abortifacients, etc. The biggest lie of all, that sex is just sex. It's just a powerful physical pleasure. That's the biggest lie of all. Sex is never just sex, right? Sex is huge. Sex changes your life. A baby changes your life. Changes your life forever. And so you're engaging in an act that could change your life forever. Right? It can't be trivial. It can't be nothing. Because it could change your life forever, the person you had life forever, and more importantly, the baby that comes into existence. There could be a baby that's a result of the sexual act. That baby deserves a mother and a father that are together, committed to each other for the rest of their lifetime. So why would people be having sex who are not married? Well, because it's a pleasure, of course. But is there any responsibility in that? I mean, contraceptives fail. Sex is meant to make, is for making love and making families. That's what sex is for, not just for pleasure. It's for making love and making families, that God is love. And God created male and female to be lovers. That's why he made us, to be lovers. And out of that love, he wanted children. God made the whole universe for human souls. That's why he made it. He gave this great, the first line of Humana Vitae says, the very the extremely important mission of transmitting human life that God has entrusted to spouses. The extremely important mission of transmitting human life that God has entrusted to spouses. God wants new life. He made the whole universe for souls to be with him in heaven. Right? 
spouses, when they have a child, are performing a service. Humanivite speaks of them performing a service for God. They're helping create a new human soul. So, three reasons to condemn contraception. It's a violation of the good of a woman's physical and psychological health. I haven't talked a lot about that, but boy, go look it up. <laughs> you, the side effects of contra I once had a priest friend who would give the, the side effects that are listed for the contraceptive pill in the package from the pharmacy. And he would have the, when couples came to him for preparation, he'd have the male read all the side effects. And then he'd say aloud with her there. He said, would you take one of those? And they'd go, so do you want her to take one of those? And she's looking at him, <laughs> okay. The right. question is, why would you do it? All right. It's impediment to the total self-giving of spousal love. I'll say just a few things about that, but that's John Paul II's major insight. And it's a rejection of God as the creator of new life. I was asked by a young person, if you, if you had 25 words or less to explain why contraception is wrong, how, how would you do it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that there is a way. But I told him, I think one of the most important things to get people to see is this difference. John Paul II talked about the language of the body. And he says, sex has a certain language. In the body, you shake hands, you mean something. You kiss someone, you mean something. You punch them in the nose, you mean something. Body speaks a language. Right? So says a sexual act speaks a language. It's meant to say, of course, that I find you extremely attractive. I want to enjoy a great pleasure with you. I want to give you a pleasure. I want to receive a pleasure. I want to make you happy. Um, and I'm willing to be a parent with you. He said, that's what the sexual act means. I'm willing to be a parent with you. Now think of that, I mean, sexual, contraceptive sex says, by its very nature, I want to have sex with you, but not babies, but not babies, right? It's a momentary act. You know, you don't have to much care for this person. We can all make a long list, and we shouldn't, of people that we want to have sex with, right? Don't do it. But you could. It'd be a long list, right? But you don't necessarily want to have breakfast with them. You only have sex with them, right? Right? That's a, that's a stupid list. Now, the list of people you want to have a baby with is a very short list. Very short list. You say, my goodness, why is that? Because having a baby with someone says, I mean, you're unbelievably wonderful, right? I like your laugh. I like your walk. I like your eyes. Most importantly, I like your values. I want my children to be raised by someone like you. Right? Babies are our most important thing. You want your children to be raised by a good person. Right? What a thing to say to another person. I want you to be the parent of my children. People fall over if anybody says that to you. I mean, what more affirming statement is there? What's more affirming? Because what does that mean? That does mean breakfast. Right? It means PTA. It means saving for college. It means living through all the fights and the disappointments and everything else. It means enjoying raising a family together and everything that comes with that. So I want to say the biggest difference if you want to work on it is to contraceptive sex says I want a, a, a momentary physical act with you. Even if your life is said different, something different by getting married to this person, this sexual act means I want to have sex with you, a physical pleasure. Saying I want you to be the mother of my children, again, says I'm here forever. I'm here for the long term. I'm yours. I want my whole life I want my whole life bound up with your life. Because babies, in fact, are bonding, incredibly bonding. If you have a baby, you're with this person forever, in some way. As I, both of my sisters have been, in, been divorced. Those men, because of the father of their children, are very much in their lives. As my sister, one sister says, marriage lasts, but divorce, <laughs> marriage ends, but divorce lasts forever. That's what she's discovered. She said, marriage ends, but divorce lasts forever. Because I can't get rid of him, right? He's always there because of my children. She's had an annulment, happily remarried. She's doing great. But you know, there's, you've had a child with someone. You rightly have forevermore a lifetime relationship with that person because you've had a child together, and that child deserves two parents who care for that, each other and for and for them. All right, I'm almost done. All right, whoops, wrong way. I want you to think about this in respect to yourself and everyone else, that God creates, creates each and every human soul individually. Right? He does not have a, a warehouse with pre-manufactured human souls right? that go down some con con little conveyor belt and plops into the next fertilized ovum. When that sperm meets that egg, God creates a new human soul. It didn't exist before. 
So if something comes into existence, just like the whole universe, in a certain way, God creates a new universe every time a new human being comes into existence. Because this is something that didn't exist before, exists now, and really will exist for an eternity. So that's what you've done. You've brought something into existence who has an immortal soul. Now, you can't do that by yourself. The male sperm does not have an immortal soul. The female egg does not have an immortal soul. The two of them together cannot make an immortal soul. Only God can make an immortal soul. So he has to be involved in every act of conception. So he's there in your sexual act. He's there. Right? This is, in our culture, unfortunately, things about sex not only being just for pleasure, but they largely think of it as being dirty, kind of naughty. Sex is something, you, you know, it's porn pornographic. Kids are learning about sex through pornography. That's what sex is. See, so, you know, sex is sacred. Sex is something that couples do in a sacred space. And they're basically inviting God during the fertile period to create a new human soul. That's what they're doing. And if he decides not to, who knows why? But that's what you're extending that invitation to him, which is a beautiful invitation. Now, this is going to make everybody a little bit sad, me too. But our culture now lives, and we can't see that in every human being. We can't see that every human being has an immortal soul and is this beautiful little creature that God has sent us from, from heaven. Now, some of you know who this is. This is this little boy, Alfie, who just, he died today, actually, last night. Um, lived for 15 months or so. They his, had some neurological um, brain degenerate degenerative disease. Now there might have been justice in withdrawing his life support in some scenarios, but the point is the parents really, really wanted to um, continue to keep the baby alive, not by extraordinary measures, had opportunities to take him to other hospitals and everything. The English government would have let them, and they just couldn't, I just, it was hardness of heart that just drove me crazy. Just watching these parents who all they wanted to do was shower this baby with love. And the baby was given that love back. You could sure as hell heck see it, right? And anybody that could watch that scenario and say, we're not going to let you take him home, right? I don't get it. But I think they didn't see it. They don't see it. You see, we have eyes to see. We have eyes to see that baby. They said, the court even said, well, the problem, the problem is he looks like a healthy little boy. And I said, no, the problem is he looks like a little boy. <laughs> he looks like a little boy whose parents love him, who have or made an image and likeness of God. And they see that. And they say, just because you're never going to you know, read a book or win a contest or throw a football doesn't mean you aren't a beautiful creation by God. The father used the language of the Brits, which is, this is my gorgeous boy. He said, this is my gorgeous boy. And he was a gorgeous boy. So what I want to say is, again, our culture is in treating the sexual act as something that is threatening because there might be a baby on the other end of it has made us devalue human life completely. Right? If, if pregnancy is a huge threat and it gets in the way of our best pleasure, which is sex, then what results from sex is also going to be a threat, again, which is the pregnancy. And what's a pregnancy? A pregnancy is a new human being with an immortal soul. So we have to reduce the value of what's at the other end of the sexual act in order to be able to justify our tampering with that act. Well, I thank you for your patience and your generosity. Thank you very much.